started. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Actually, it's morning, but yes, Still, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. I wanted to thank you all for coming out and attending our event today. Uh, I want to thank our presenters for taking time out of their busy schedule to come out and talk to us about this important topic. Uh, first, let's give a big thanks to our presenters for coming out today. <laughs> Some thank yous here, a special thank you to Kara Williams. Uh, Kara, thank you for helping us organize this panel and to Dr. Amy Williamson too for helping us connect with some of our speakers and bringing them on campus. I'd also like to thank uh, some students from our psychology club uh, for helping us out here and uh, ushering in the audience and, and sharing some of the information that's on your, uh, uh, that are on your chairs too. And um, also thanks to Mick Baker too for helping us gather questions later. Uh, thank you to the liberal arts department for supporting us to have events like this on campus every year. Uh, this is our seventh annual mental health program and we like to do this in May to recognize Mental Health Month. Um, our program is going to take about an hour and our panelists are going to share some info and then we're going to have about a half hour afterwards for questions and answers. And regarding the questions and answers, uh, near your seats you're going to find note cards. And uh, if you don't have a note card, I'll ask you to take a note card. And those note cards are designed for you to write down the questions that you have for the panelists. Now, at some point, uh, maybe about 11.45 or so, Mitch Baker, where uh, uh, Mitch and Kara are going to collect some of the cards, and they're going to do their best to try <laughs> to go through the cards and, ans and ask the questions to our panelists, So, which is why I put the names of the panelists in front of us here. So if you have a question specifically for one of the panelists, you can write that down. Um, so we're going to cover today ADHD, a pretty important topic, also known as Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. It's uh, affecting a lot of students, not only here at Moraine, but across campuses on the United States. Uh, some research says that 4% of college students have ADHD. 9%, 9 to 10% of kids have ADHD, which means, so maybe some of them either don't make it to college or they outgrow it, or perhaps they've learned to cope with it, they don't meet the diagnostic criteria. So that means 4%. 4% of the people in this room might have ADHD. Our college has 18,000 students, which means that roughly 720 Moraine Valley students struggle with this disorder. So that's a big deal. Uh, just a quick raise of hands, uh, do you guys know anybody who has ADHD? Just raise your hands if you know somebody. That's a lot of people, okay, so it's, it's a pretty big deal. Um, so hopefully the info that you're going to hear today is going to be helpful. You're going to learn something new about ADHD. In fact, uh, uh, perhaps understand the people in your lives a little bit better and maybe learn how to be able to help them as well. So, which is why we've asked our panel to share some info with us and educate us on the topic. Uh, so I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves and then we're going to get started. Uh, let's get started if we can. Uh, if, 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 uh, Panelists can introduce themselves, tell us uh, who you are and, and, and where we come from. So it's certainly a pleasure to be here and always uh, be here with people associated with Moraine. I'm Val Nowinski. I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist for greater than 35 years, so <laughs> I guess I should add that. <laughs> uh, clinical and research neuropsychology. So I look forward to discussing this wonderful topic with you. And I'm Dorena Madden. I work with Val Nowinski, but I also uh, work with teachers, with families, with students, because my background is really more in education, family counseling, uh, and special education. Uh, so I bring a slightly different, uh, a, a different view. Yes. Are you just oh, yes. Sorry. <coughs> I'm Don Sibley. I was I worked for 34 years as a school psychologist in Arlington Heights, and I now teach at the university level at Loyola and NIU. So I had occasion to see many students with ADHD and a number of students who were suspected of it, but it turned out there were other conditions that were creating issues. So we've had a lot of experience with that as well. Um, I'm Sue Chetty, and I work at Alexian Brothers Behavioral Health in Hoffman Estates and also at the Therapy Center as a psychotherapist um, close to here in Orland Park. And I've been working with kids and teens, young adults um, with ADHD for about 12, 13 years. My name is Elise Parkinson. I'm here as a guest speaker. I've struggled with ADD my whole life, but I don't really struggle anymore. I'm gonna tell you guys why. Awesome, well thank you. Let's give them a hand. Uh, 
we'd like to start off with uh, Dr. Nowinski and Drina, and thank you again for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to ask you both to start us off, if you could, and share some current brain research findings about ADHD. Like, how, how does the brain of somebody with ADHD perhaps function? When we look at the most current of brain research, we have to briefly look at studies of the structure of the brain, electrical activity of the brain, chemistry, and function. Um, when it comes to structure, so we're talking about tissue, hardcore tissue, rarely is that seen, do we see abnormalities of tissue in attention deficit disorder. Um, the thing to remember about attention deficits is that it is a very, very large spectrum. So you can have an attention disorder and not have ADD. The more serious attention disorders that move into the pervasive autistic spectrums, brain tumors, strokes, chromosomal disorders, acquired traumatic brain injuries, the injuries that are associated with more severe attention problems in the brain, those are the ones that show up with abnormalities of structure on MRIs, which are the magnetic resonance imaging that looks at the tissue of the brain. In, in the lighter end of the spectrum, although very important and very serious, it is still an attention deficit disorder. It's not the serious, the more pervasive attention disorders. Does not, again, uh, usually correlate with structural tissue problems in the brain. Electrically, uh, the, the brain, brain cells called neurons need chemistry to transmit from one to the other, but they need electrical impulses to let the chemistry transmit. And in attention disorders, um, there is in attention deficits, there is a 10 to 20 percent group of individuals that show up with more of what are called electrophysiological dysrhythms in, or a slowing, and if it's not a slowing of the brain wave, it's more of a dysrhythm that can become um, excessive, and that's what we call a seizure disorder. Now, not necessarily seizure meaning convulsive, because not many uh, are associated with convulsive seizures. But there are a group of individuals with attention disorders that do have abnormal brainwave patterns that are seizure. That's why at the office we make sure that we run EEGs on all the kids who present with serious attention deficits because even at the lighter end of an attention deficit, you're talking 10, 20 percent can have electrical dysrhythms. And again, if you're going to treat, we need to know what we're treating. Cannot give a stimulant to somebody or other behavioral plans to somebody who's, just ha who's having um, you know, an electrical problem where you're going to spend 10 years doing what you can do in 10 months. You have to clear up the electrical activity. So in attention deficit, the electrical abnormalities are more these dysrhythms, although they can become significant to the point of what we call actual seizure activity. But they're the silent seizures. You can't see them. It's the kids who come in and say, Doc, I'm daydreaming. I, I just stare off and I miss what's going on, you know. And even though chemical imbalances can do that, electrical activity can play a role in the, in the smaller percentage. Again, it's important to know, though, that as you move into the more serious attention disorders, that statistic is high. You probably have read in the literature that in autism or related pervasive attention disorders, the statistic for a seizure is over 60 percent. Uh, that's why always it's very important today as we're listening about attention to remember it's a big, big spectrum from a light end referred to as an attention deficit with or without hyperactivity. Actually, kids can have go back and forth, or it moves into the more serious attention uh, problems. As far as chemistry, uh, there's no blood test for the brain when it comes <laughs> to chemistry. And people who run them are charlatans, because the next minute, chemistry is going to look different you know, in the brain. So we uh, look at uh, flow and metabolism uh, through functional MRI magnetic resonance images, or PET scans, positron emission tomography that looks at metabolism in the brain. A and then we correlate it with neuropsychological tests, which are the major tests for the functions of brain development. And what the most current research is showing, think it's like if you watch a weather map, you know how certain, um, um, you'll see when there's more active um, storms, you'll see active red going on, and then you see lighter areas where it isn't as bad of, the, of weather. Well, the same in the brain. When you're watching the metabolism of the brain, what we do is you can insert an isotope that tricks the brain into believing it's sugar, and you watch the metabolism in the brain. And what we see as far as metabolism, uh, and, and I should say the major uh, transmitters, which are neurotransmitters are homo hormones in the brain. Chemistry the next down are hormones in the brain. Hormones are called neurochemicals. 
And we know that the inattention deficits, the chemicals that don't metabolize as well are the ones associated with the ones that stimulate the brain. That's why when you have decreased stimulation, of much of the medicine is to stimulate, to, give it, to stimulate the, those chemicals, mostly dopamine. However, when we look at metabolism in the brain, it is the deeper brain areas that affect attention span. Okay, and those, they're the, think of them, they are the foundation of the area of the brain. If, it, if you don't have the core of attention, we don't learn, we don't develop, we don't control mood and memory and language and, and learning well if we can't attend well. So it does, it's not unusual to see when you look at ADD individuals and non-ADD individuals, the metabolism in the deeper brain that controls all this attention is just doesn't light up with as much red as, as the other areas. But what we see is that the mood centers, and this is more current research, which is very interesting, the mood centers of the brain actually, if we have time we'll talk about it, they actually go through every sensory attention pathway in the human brain. Visual attention, auditory attention, motor attention, the mood pathways go through every single one of those. So what happens is that over six, and in the fMRI research, over 60% of individuals in the ADD population show up with heightened red in the mood brain okay, because mood is highly associated. And if you happen to be really bright because you can be have a gifted IQ and have an attention deficit, you're gonna spend a lot of time overcompensating and overcompensating, and then the brain being a protective organ is just gonna send out stress hormones and say, caution, caution, you're so bright, but you just stared off, <laughs> right, or, something, or you're hyper. So stress hormones go out. So 60% we're seeing of, of the limbic mood brain starts to light up in studies um, in ADD. Interestingly, about 30% of the, or a third, I'd say, of the time, you're seeing um, related learning problems. The motor brain lights up, the language brain lights up, the memory brain lights up, and that's because attention starts to affect those other areas. Um, and interestingly, and then I'll, I'll turn it over, the sleep centers are interesting because remember the attention areas of the brain uh, is ri right in the middle of the brain. The, the deeper brain controls our vital organs, you know, respiration, digestion, and, and et cetera. You move up in the brain stem and it involves sleep and appetite. And then the attention area affects what you hear, see, taste, touch, and smell in the higher brain. So not only is it related to mood and learning problems and memory problems and learning problems regardless of IQ, but you can see in these studies the sleep centers of the brain, the area of the attention brain that goes down in the brain starts to get affected. So that's why over 50%, the current research is over 50%, and I, in my practice, in our practice, we see if we see, you see children, you see sleep problems across the board, okay? So it's, I think it's far more than 50% just in our, in the, and we've seen thousands of children in 35 years, not hundreds, you know, and all we do is test brain in children. We know that their sleep disorders are, are marked. But it's interesting that the current literature is saying that 50% of individuals with attention deficit also have difficulty with sleep. And then that's gonna compound the issue. If you're not asleep, you're not gonna attend the next day. And Dr. Nowinski, thank you for that. I, I, I'd like to ask, uh, too, we're curious if there are, are, are there any formal neurological tests or evaluations to diagnose somebody with, a, with ADHD? Uh, well, and perhaps maybe even what are some treatments, too, for our, sa you know, for our sake of time, if we could share some of those things. Okay. Uh, <coughs> treatment, I think I'll, interdisciplinary treatment, I'll, I'll send to, I'll give to over to Drina. But briefly, as far as evaluation, mm -hmm. <coughs> In neuroscience, in neuropsychological, neural brain psychology behavior, since there's no blood test, brain tests had to be developed that look at what are the functions of brain. So attention, perception, memory, speech, language, sensory motor, mood, social functions. And in neuroscience, we have very advanced technology. Advances in technology have been wonderful for neurosciences. We have the technology of testing millisecond images, eye to eye brain for visual attention millisecond uh, sound, ear to ear brain for auditory attention, millisecond sensory motor impulses, okay, for motor attention. And then we test the impact of that upon memory and language, uh, thinking, et cetera. We look at IQ and achievement tests. We have a tremendous respect for looking at all the educational data because you want to correlate that data with the neuroscience data. If you remember years ago, checklists were used for attention deficits and we published our own checklist, uh, but, and they're noted, but they are, checklists, you know, and they're important to do, but they're not uh, formal evidence-based uh, testing. 
neuropsychological tests are very evidence-based. We, we have the technology. Nothing's invasive. Nothing hurts. They're fascinating. And you get to see, actually, how the uh, attention is affecting the brain. But then we correlate it with the EGs, the MRIs, the sleep studies, et cetera, all the educational data. Uh, so that's the, that is a, there are wonderful ways to, to test the ability to attend. Exactly. Uh, with, though, in neuroscience, the main focus is the neuropsychological eval because they are the only tests available that are evidence-based to look at attention. And then, yes, you always use the interdiscipline. That's what makes cool. the world go round. And, and, if, and if anybody in the audience starts to have a question, or if you have a question, I, I will invite you to write it down on your card. If you have a card in front of you, and uh, our colleagues Mitch Baker and Kara Williams will collect those cards at some point. But if you have questions, please write them on your cards, too. Uh, and then we were curious about treatment, uh, right. brain-based treatments. Right. And I'll just be very briefly tie a few thoughts together here from what, that, uh, what, Va what Val had said. Um, the topic is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but people can have attention deficits and not be hyperactive. Uh, you notice doctors referring to attention disorder. Well, one of the symptoms of having an attention disorder is, in some people, hyperactivity, but as doctor mentioned, it's often the the brain chemical dopamine that is implicated, it can also be showing up in people as high po activity. Hmm. Um, so uh, the AD, the H, uh, from my experience as this uh, neurodevelopmental specialist, is what I call myself, uh, with the work that I do as a developmental uh, specialist, is to be aware of that um, regardless of whether the person is showing the symptoms of being hyperactive or hypoactive, they are having difficulty focusing, sustaining, and mm -hmm. then switching their attention. So what we've gotten over the years with the checklist that Val was referring to is a lot of looking at the symptoms of, you know, like they're driven by a motor, they don't finish tasks, uh, they're unable to stay seated in place, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, those are the symptoms, but they are not the earmarks of what we know about the brain as to what's actually going on within the brain. They're just the symptoms that show up on the outside. So we have to be careful when we look at treatment to not just be treating the symptoms, but to look at the person who is within and what do their attention issues look like. Now, the doctor uh, does testing that is without the fMRIs, those beautiful colored uh, maps that we now can see. Her testing indicates what's going on within the brain, and as a result of that, it basically ends up looking like the fMRI as a result of the testing. But what we learn from the testing then is how the person's brain is designed, and then what do you, this one person, need to help you to focus your attention better? Then, from a treatment view, what we do is we work on, is it <coughs> visual attention? Is it auditory attention? Is it motor attention? Helping you to awaken your brain to be able to focus your attention better. Helping you to use your frontal lobe to be able to realize when you're losing it and finding ways to help you control those attention difficulties. Um, I work a lot with teachers with younger children and then also with the older population as well, all the way through grade school, high school, and into college. But um, I say often, 
the way to treat a person with an attention deficit is truly to have them working by themselves in a small space with earphones perhaps even mm -hmm. to close out the noises because their brain is unable to filter and slowly help them to learn how to filter better and while they're learning to become a better filterer, to become better able to attend, see, it, as you slowly can pay attention to tasks, complete it, shift your gears in a very small setting, slowly but surely you can generalize to the world at large. The way to help a child with an attention deficit to become more social is to not put them in the middle of the playground at recess time. They need to learn how to attend to the cues of being with others in a small one-to-one -one setting and then slowly to help to generalize. Wonderful. Adrena, thank you. <laughs> sure. Let me just one moment briefly add. Thanks, Gina, very much so. Uh, the only thing I would add to that is treatment should always be extremely interdisciplinary. Yep. Whole brain, whole person, no matter what age. So we make very sure that we look at the medical, you know, the biophysiological, the psychological, the educational. And I al we always say to families, and we would hope that they pursue the spiritual, how can you lose? The reason we see tremendous growth in thousands of kids over the years and, they, and we still get all their beautiful letters as adults and how well they're doing. Why? Because you treat the whole person. Very important to be interdisciplinary. And, and if I might add also, the doctor talks about interdisciplinary. She talked about those seizures that some of the people with ADD, not ADD, they have attention difficulties, but it's really because of the electrical problems those people's brains need to be treated differently with different medications, if indeed medication is decided, than those who have a chemical base only attention deficit. There are many ways to treat besides medication. And neurobiofeedback is one that's extremely beneficial, regardless of the source of the attention issue. But, but again, to look at the whole person and all of who they are and all of the, the environment that is uh, touching them and that they are involved with. And certainly, I think we'll get questions from the audience, too, about, uh, about treatment. But uh, uh, <laughs> when turning the focus into school, Don, thank you for being here as well. Uh, with your experience as a school psychologist or in school psychology, uh, how does ADHD affect student learning? And, and, and perhaps what might it look like in a classroom, either maybe for an adult or a child, but e either way? Well, I, one of the things that you've, I think, hopefully heard very clearly is it's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. So what we see in schools can range from really mild impact to really significant impairment uh, of student performance. And kids that have um, ADHD, or certainly kids that are suspected of it, um, tend to underperform their non-ADHD kids academically, behaviorally, and socially. So they have problems in all of those realms. And the, the degree to which they're experiencing the difficulty also has an impact in terms of the degree of impact on their learning. Um, the inattentive students, the ones that are not hyperactive, impulsive, can go for years without people being aware of what they're dealing with. Uh, one of my current students uh, reports that she, it wasn't discovered that she had a, a inattentive type ADHD until she was 18 years old. So she had gone all through school with a lot of struggles. What was to her benefit was she also was very bright, so she could kind of cover for some of those difficulties. But the inattentive type is, is harder to diagnose. The kids that have the hyperactive impulsive types of, of ADHD, everybody knows what they kind of look like. They have trouble sitting still. Um, they're fidgety, they're restless in classrooms. Sitting in a lecture for those students is extremely painful, and um, they they need to move. Um, I think in classrooms, teachers will describe uh, students that are inattentive as doing a lot of daydreaming, having difficulty remembering series of instructions. Uh, they might remember part of it, and they'll try to start a task with the last instruction because that's the last one they remember. Um, 
they have difficulty completing tasks, they will start tasks, they will have difficulty finishing them. Kids that are hyperactive, impulsive, you use the term driven by a motor. That's what they look like in classrooms. Um, they have trouble staying in their seat, they're fidgety, they're restless. They're the kids that are tapping the pencils, um, driving teachers crazy. Um, they, need, they tend to get a lot of reprimands uh, to get back on task, to get in their seat, to whatever. These kids also talk out a lot in class, uh, either to their peers or they're shouting out answers when the teachers are waiting for other kids to raise their hand and be recognized. They can't wait, so they just they talk out. Um, the kids that are hyperactive, that have the hyperactivity, the impulsivity, they get noticed. There's no question. They get, they get noticed. Um, these are also kids that get in trouble more frequently than other kids, and they don't understand why they're in trouble. They will, in, in PE class or at recess, they play and they engage at, with a level of exuberance that most of their peers can't understand. And as a result, they, they will injure other students without intending to do so. And then they'll find themselves in the principal's office and they truly don't understand why they're there. So there are a lot of those kinds of issues that we see in the schools. I see. Thank you. Uh, now, say a, a teacher notices a student wants and, and, and believes the student might need some assistance. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that students are identified and assessed and maybe how they're helped in the school? Well, we, the schools have to focus on the educational component. And in an ideal situation, we would be working with somebody like Val or with a private physician or somebody who is, has a lot of experience in assessing the students, but we don't always have that, that capability. Um, the, one of the things I think is important to understand is schools cannot require parents to have their child evaluated and placed on medication as a component of the educational process. Um, we can, as, an, with, as a school team, we can recommend that they do that, but if the school recommends it, they need to be prepared to pay for the, the evaluation. So, the, but the, the primary focus of the schools is to address the academic educational needs of the student. So, what we, you use the term, um, I can't remember, but pulling together a whole lot of information, a whole lot of data. Our goal is to get as much information as we can about the student so we can really understand what their educational needs are. And the first place we start is with a review of the student records mm -hmm. to try to build a history, uh, a sense of what the student has been dealing with as long as they've been in school and hopefully prior to being in school. So, pardon? Yeah, so we will talk to the student, we'll talk to their parents, we will talk to current and previous teachers. Um, we always talk to specials teachers because there are students who have a very difficult time functioning in an academic classroom, but they are stars in sports. And we need to get that whole picture to understand really what is going on with that student. We can't just focus on what they look like in history class, for example, in high school. Uh, we need to know if they're on the basketball team, for example, we need to know what the coach sees. Um, in elementary school, we talk with current and previous teachers to the extent that we can do that. We interview parents. Uh, we do a lot of direct observation in a lot of different settings because students can have more difficulty in one setting than another. We need to know that. We need to know what about a given situation is helping them function more effectively in, say, this classroom as opposed to, the, to another classroom. So the, the idea is to collect as much information as we can to build the history and to get a clean, uh, as clear a picture as we can of what is going on with them educationally. And Don, is that where the it, the school or the, uh, the team would put together perhaps a five a five hundred four IEP? Well, yeah, and those? they are very different animals. Right. And I think that's important to understand. A five hundred four plan is actually an accommodation plan, and what that does is it's it's designed to eliminate barriers or improve access to learning for students, but it's not intended to change the instruction dramatically. Uh, for example, if you have a student who is having difficulty um, with attention, some of the things you might think about are not sitting them next to the door, um, not sitting them next to a noisy heating vent or a window that looks out on the playground during recess. Um, you always want to make sure, for example, that they're facing the teacher during instruction. Um, it, if you go into class, I always, when I go into classrooms, I always draw a picture of the classroom and the layout and 
more often than not, the students that have been identified as being a concern be for attention or whatever are seated in such a way that when the teacher is instructing, they have to turn around in their desk or in their seat to follow instruction. And if the teacher is doing instruction and then they're doing um, work on a paper or something and then they get more instruction, they have to keep turning back and forth. After a while, they quit doing that because it's too much work. So one of the things we look at is rearranging the seating so that they can be in a better location. Um, that's an accommodation. It's not really changing the instruction. Um, an IEP is a special education document that specifies very clear uh, goals and objectives for the students, how we're going to get them there, um, how we're going to monitor their progress, and what kind of uh, supports we're going to provide them to make the growth toward those goals. So the 504 plan is generally an ed is a general education plan, mm -hmm. and an IEP is special education. Now, regarding uh, any interventions, I know some, uh, and, and some, those are some of the accommodations that are made for some of the students in the 504, but are, are there any specific school interventions, uh, aside from a couple that you mentioned, that, that might be common to when working with students with this type of... Uh, seating of arrangements are very common, yeah. changes in seating. Um, that's one of the, f the, the f one of the things that, that can help students a lot. The other things that are that are interesting, um, we had one student a number of years ago that was extremely hyperactive, impulsive, and even on medication, um, he literally could not stay in his seat, and so we got him a standing desk. Nice. And that resolved a lot of issues. Uh, there are many teachers who are comfortable having students stand by their desk as long as they're not disturbing other students to complete their work. Uh, other things that sometimes help are, um, we call them fidgets, but Velcro under the edge of their desk or the bottom of their seats that they can rub their fingers on, um, koosh balls, as long as they're not throwing them. Um, there are a lot of those kinds of things that can, can help kids in classrooms. Um, modifying assignments so that they may have less work to complete, uh, being very careful about um, the instructions that they receive. Uh, students that have attention difficulties cannot truly cannot receive and process a long series of instructions. So one of the things that, one of the interventions that we often need to talk with teachers about is short and sweet. So give them very succinct, very brief instructions, uh, preferably one or two at a time. Let them follow those or complete those and then give them some more. It's, it's a challenge for the teacher sometimes to do that. Other things that can help with that are to have a model of the finished product so they know what it's supposed to look like. So yeah. if they didn't understand all the instructions, they've got a picture of it to look at. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for your insights. We appreciate it. Uh, and, and lastly, if we could ask, uh, are there any suggestions that you might have for parents, teachers, instructors, or maybe even students? Yeah, there's a whole sure, host sure. of Actually, there's, that's list. what's on the handout. Oh, yeah. yeah, let's talk about that. Because <laughs> the list was getting too long to talk about. Um, you mentioned sleep, and that's a huge issue. Um, one of the things that's really important for, for kids uh, in general but particularly for these kids is make sure they get enough rest because they are in a setting that is putting a huge load on their system for six hours a day. And they get tired. These kids get really tired uh, much more frequently and much more easily than their non-ADHD peers. So getting enough rest is really important for these kids. Um, I've been reading recently that, that a lot of the thinking is with, with some, with, particularly with hyperactive impulsive kids, is, is to not change, try to change the behavior, but try to work with it, try to turn it into something more positive. So one of the things that we found helpful, and we, we sort of did this without realizing this is where the research was headed, but um, giving them active tasks in school. Let them be the paper passers in the classroom. Let them run errands down to the office so they have a built-in opportunity for exercise. Um, for parents at home, it's really important that they have a consistent homework space that is stocked with all their necessary supplies. Um, they should not have to go looking for anything because that will turn into something other than homework. Um, like I said, there's a whole host of um, possi possibilities. And it really, you really have to look at the individual child and determine what their needs are with regard to the learning components to develop interventions or accommodation plans that really meet their needs. Um, it's not, it, you can't do a cookbook approach. So you really do have to think about what's going on with the individual student. Great, and, and some of the suggestions that you're offering are also on our handout too, uh, that you'll find in all of your seats. Thank you, Don. Thank you. And, uh, uh, 
Sue, Sue, how are you? Uh, happy, happy to have you here with us today, uh, and uh, uh, to share some of your experiences that you've had as a so as a social worker and as a therapist. And one of the questions that we wanted to ask you was, what kind of issues do you see in your office? Like, what do you notice that tends to bring people into treatment? Um, most of the time, by the time they come into my office, they've already had some significant um, problems. Uh, depending on the age, but usually, um, usually I'm seeing kids that are coming in with ADHD and young adults. But usually the kids they're ha they're coming in um, because they're having social issues and academic issues. Those are the two main problems that we're seeing. Um, usually, not usually, maybe about half the time they're already there are already interventions going on at school, and the child still isn't um, succeeding. Um, so they're, they're coming in because they're failing classes, they have no friends, they're isolated, and the parents are concerned. And frustrated maybe too. And frustra yeah. Absolutely, yeah. very frustrated. Actually, everybody's frustrated. Yeah, the <laughs> teachers are frustrated because yeah. often, you know, um, more than likely as the school is involved, I'm getting a release of information and I'm on the phone um, trying to get a hold of the teacher to get a different picture because usually the, sometimes the parents are not reporting everything accurately um, for a multiple number of reasons, but I'm always on the phone with the <laughs> teacher to find out exactly what's happening in the classroom. So th those are the main things that bring people into treatment? Um, the kids. Yeah, yeah, um, right. Young adults, however, I have found to be a different story. Um, the ADHD is sometimes masked by depression and anxiety, and they're coming in because they're, they're depressed, they're not succeeding, they're not where their peers are at, um, so they're isolating, um, and they're finding daily life more and more difficult. And the more conversations that I have with them, I see that they're struggling with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and that has resulted in one of the symptoms that, ha that has come about is the depression and the anxiety. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, so they're going to come to your office, and there's probably going to be a host of, 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 of of psychological treatment, perhaps maybe even behavioral treatment that they might be seeking. What are some of the treatments that you might use or a therapist might use with uh, a student, a young adult, perhaps? The two main interventions that I use for a young adult would be coaching um, and CBT work. So with the coaching, uh, providing them and, and helping them to practice specific skills in order to be able to manage their ADHD. Um, and then also doing the cognitive behavioral work with them um, to teach them how to be more mindful of what is going on with their, their thoughts, their feelings, their behaviors, and how it's all connected. Is behavior modification uh, still being currently used? I still use it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, especially at home, um, because the, I need to send the parents home with a lot of education, but also some specific concrete tools to use at home. And it also helps the, the kids to feel successful. Behavior modification is a, is a very important intervention with the kids. Yeah. Yeah, I, Don, I just wanted, please. wanted to add, too, that uh, Val, you had mentioned, too, the need for the multidimensional interventions. And I think that's really important to highlight because there's a, there's a tendency to think that medication will fix the problem. And medication, in my mind, makes them available for the other stuff that you're doing. Exactly. So that the, while the medication can play a very significant role, it is by no means the primary intervention that you need to look at. And it needs to be multidimensional without any question. Absolutely. I, I have a kid come into my office, for example, and the parent's like, he's been on Adderall for the last year and a half, and it's not doing what it needs to do. He's still struggling. And I try to explain to them, you're, you want your child to be here in terms of functioning. This medication's gonna get them here, but the rest of this we're gonna do in our office. And it's getting him to a point where he can respond, he or she can respond better to the therapy. And everything, and all the other interventions going on at school. So your treatment team's gonna consist of a lot of people. If I could add one more thought. Um, a lot of the uh, approaches that are used are assuming that the child or the, the young adult or the adult has an attention problem. And I think a, a lot of times it is that 
they are, as you mentioned, people who need to move, and they need to do. Um, it could be that what they need is for accommodation is to have different kinds of assignments mm -hmm. that have them moving and homework that has them sitting in a, a very particular place in their home, but movement is then built in with a timer that then brings yep. them back to sit down and do. A lot of times to me, what looks like an attention disorder is, is as myself as an educator is more of a teaching disorder. <laughs> it's a matter of how do we reach this youngster yep. or this young adult to help them to be able to learn because our schools are based on an auditory input yep. where you gotta sit there and you gotta take it in. Whereas it could be that this is not an attention deficit, but an attention difference. So it's really a matter <laughs> of. That's true. And I, I would add one more thing too. The brain is a remarkably wonderful and protective and powerful organ. And human beings are wonderfully able to adapt to their environment and develop their ability to adapt with health and well-being. What is the goal of all ability to learn? The ability to adapt within one's environment with health and well-being. And the higher brain helps the lower attention brain. That's why whether you have a regular, I an average IQ or a gifted IQ, if you have an attention problem, it's a difference and you have many other wonderful abilities. And you can use the higher brain to help regulate attention of breathing and relaxation and sleep. And you can use the higher brain to help your ability to organize and plan. You can use the higher brain to develop your belief systems that actually guide our whole temperament and our styles. So there's tremendous giftedness in individuals who have attention problems. We have to look at the whole person and look at their ability to guide the higher brain also to guide the whole brain. And that's why the potential is so beautiful when it's interdisciplinary. Thank you. Uh, Sue, I have, another, I have another question, if I may. Um, we know that there's a stigma attached to any type of disorder, ADHD, or somebody might say, you know, they don't have ADHD, they're just acting bad, they're just acting out. You know, that's not a real disorder or something like that. Um, so w what if it doesn't get treated? Uh, or when should somebody seek treatment? Or, or some families might not want to admit that there might be uh, something that's different about their child's brain. Uh, so I, I'd like to ask, what, what could happen if this goes untreated? So if as they make it through the school system, somehow the parents have been able to kind of keep them, con keep them contained, and through the school system, their intelligence has gotten them through, they finish high school. Um, what do they do next? Um, they don't have the skills they, and there's no teacher standing over them, their parents aren't standing over them, and now you have an adult who's unable to make decisions. Um, you have an adult who um, has poor social skills, uh, they can be reckless. I mean, just being able to contain what they've got going on in their head is hard, so you see, reckless driving, getting into fights, substance abuse, um, an inability to uh, forge relationships with people. Failing classes. Um, failing cl if they make it on to college, they're failing classes. Um, they become depressed, anxious. Or failing jobs. Yeah. Failing jobs, yeah, that's, that's another oh yeah, thing. They absolutely. don't have the skills, so they're jumping from job to job to job, um, and they're not maintaining relationships. Um, they have no plan. So they should seek some treatment. Absolutely, absolutely. I, yeah. If I could add to uh, very much, very well said, the early, earlier the better, absolutely. obviously. Yes. Yes. The earlier <laughs> the better. And you know, <laughs> the earlier we've seen the kids to become these wonderful young adults who don't experience those uh, difficulties with early treatment because their brain allows them, the, the environment has allowed their brain in an interdisciplinary fashion to be all they can be. Just earlier before we, we started the session, one of the individuals in the audience who's a, an outstanding, outstanding learning specialist uh, told us a story of a young woman who I happen to also see who's very gifted, who has definitely has an attention problem, but has these lovely parents that sought out early intervention 
tries to get through the ACT, you know, and SAT without extra time, but because of all the er early documentation, of it, et cetera, was able to then go get it on time, got a 35 on the ACT, okay? <laughs> you know, before that struggle. Genius. But, you know, if you, a very, a very gifted young woman. But interdisciplinary treatment was important, and early identification was important. Without it, it's hard for us to adapt, any one of us, whether we have an attention problem or not. You know, we have to be able to help kids with attention problems become very happy, healthy, loving, adaptive well-beings, and the earlier we treat, the better. It's like taking the blinders off. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. And so if somebody goes and gets treatment, uh, what, what do we think might help them be successful in therapy? I know you've treated clients, you've treated clients. Uh, any suggestions on what might make therapy more successful with a student I think or anyone? Most importantly, the appropriate diagnosis. Um, we want to make sure that we're treating what we're supposed to be treating them for. And ADHD is often masked, like I said before, by depression and anxiety. Um, I also want my client to stop blaming themselves. Um, I do a lot of strength-based work with them, and they need a lot of the clients that I see are very defeated. I'm sick. I'm never going to get better. I've got ADHD. Nobody understands. So um, having them engage in therapy to stop blaming themselves, building an a, a relationship with them is very important because especially if I have a young adult come in or an adult with ADHD, uh, they don't know how to build an appropriate relationship. So my first task is to build a relationship with them. They don't know how. Um, and using their support system and the people around them, their family members, doctors, other people will help. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think we have a few minutes. In fact, uh, b before we, we get to this last piece, because uh, we'd like to sh uh, have at least share some info with us as well from her experiences, uh, if you have any questions that you would like to prepare for the for our panel here, please write them down. I'm going to invite Kara Williams and, uh, and and Mitch to collect them at some point, just so we uh, when we do our Q and A, uh, hopefully they'll be able to get to your questions. Uh, but please go ahead, Dr. Minsky. I, I can't emphasize enough your point of uh, if you're going to treat, know what you're treating. So that's the point of differential diagnosis mm -hmm. at any age. And as kids, as we've just heard from all the wonderful speakers, as kids get older. If they haven't been identified early, or even if they have but haven't received interdisciplinary treatment, of course they have more difficulty then adapting to the world. So treatment has to treat the whole person is what I'm getting back again. If we, we have technology for, for di differential diagnosis that makes us look at attention reflexes that cause attention disorders. You know, we know you can look hyper or hypo, but it's because if information from the eye to the eye brain is jumping all over the place and your right eye, left eye is jumping all over the place, not only are you going to have a visual attention problem, but you're going to start to have a learning disability because you're not going to read on time. Your eyes are going to jump on, whether you have a gifted IQ, your eyes are going to jump all over the place and it's going to affect your, your reading rate, your writing rate. It if the motor attention reflexes are off, you're going to be developing fine motor, gross motor problems. You know, if the, mo if the mood reflexes are off, you have mood problems. If the memory ones are off, you're going to have other learning problems too. So the better a person is diagnosed with formal neuroscience, evidence-based testing in conjunction with all the other interdisciplinary testing, it allows you to get a treatment plan that touches that person's life, as they're saying. Because you can look at them medically, because it's very important to understand when you need to treat somebody biologically, whether it's asthma or ADD, when to get the right behavioral intervention, the educational intervention, and brain training folks like that. We have marvelous brain training programs at any age that help develop the ability to focus attention, sustain attention, switch attention. Neurofeedback being one of the most wonderful evidence-based programs. So there are multiple ways to treat, but the better you diagnose, the better the treatment. True, a absolutely. And, and if anybody is, has questions about diagnosis or treatment or you know somebody that might need treatment, please come and see the panel members afterwards to get some of their information to see where their offices are as well. I'd like to add that in the years that I've been working at the Neuropsychology Diagnostic Center, it, from I have yet to see a youngster who does not have connections with their mood, with the anxiety, with their self-esteem if they have attention problems. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it just goes with the territory. That it, you're having a harder time bringing the fullness of who you are together and being able to manage your world. The younger the children are, absolutely the better. Mm -hmm. The kind of things that Susan's talking about are people who have reached adulthood and have not been treated or have been treated, but y y you're looking at this whole person. You're looking at their whole brain. You're looking at their whole being. The sooner we can get the youngsters, the more completely we can help their attention develop, their learning to develop. And the difficulties with some folks who have attention disorder, which is the uh, difficulty organizing and planning, does, n it does not have to happen in all of them. It can be assisted more readily through brain training if you get them while they're small. And, and it takes more than just therapy to help them become people who can organize and plan. Because it's not just that they could do it if they only tried harder. They need to have their full brain connected well and awakened and helped learning how to organize and plan. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's more than just fidgeting and, and, the, and it's switching gears. It, it, it helps the whole being. Right, we have to look at the whole picture, certainly. Uh, thank you for all your insights so far. I'd like to give a hand to our panelists so far. We have one more panelist to, to share info. Um, and, and certainly last, but, but, but not at all least, uh, we're fortunate to have with us Elise here uh, today to, to share her story. And uh, Elise, you shared with us that you've struggled with ADHD in the, uh, in the past and have received treatment. And I'd like to say, too, an honor student, too. So it's <laughs> wonderful to have you with us here. Um, if you could share with our audience uh, uh, some of the struggles maybe that you may have experienced either uh, as a child or as an adult. Um, well, as a kid, it was really clear that I always had a problem sitting still. And like my mom kind of taught me to sit on my hands when I got fidgety. Like we'd be out to eat and I just like, she'd make me sit on my hands like this. And, but it turned into a real problem in school because I was very late at learning how to read. I didn't fully learn how to read by myself until fourth grade and then learning to read turned into learning to comprehend. Like it was like a completely different thing. I was like, okay, I have to read this sentence and understand it too. Like what do you what do you mean? <laughs> and <laughs> and um, sitting still I, I wrote some things down. So sitting still, excessive talking, fidgety, consistently bored, low test scores, unable to comprehend learning. Um, I was just kind of deemed as a slow learner, and so that's what my mom thought I was, was just slow at learning, you know, like you have to take a little bit more time with Elise, she'll, she'll learn, but it'll take some time. I was really indecisive, um, I, I think one of you guys mentioned that impulsive, I'm incredibly impulsive, I still <laughs> am. Um, I've, as a kid, I was always thinking like, no matter how hard I tried, it was always failure, like all the time. I could sit and study something for seven hours and it would not make a difference at all. Um, something that make, made me really nervous was when I would take tests, the teacher would stand over my shoulder. And, and like, <laughs> it's, I know that, I don't know if some people say that's a good thing, but uh, to no. me, like, I would start crying. Like, I would literally just completely cry and not focus on anything. Um, like, as an adult now, I still struggle with, like, unorganized thoughts and sentences, sitting still, staying on track with thoughts and tasks, and my vocabulary. Like, sometimes I'll be trying to explain something, and I just can't find the words at all. And I would daydream before I even realized I was daydreaming. Like, someone would, like you said, you have to give tasks in, like, a specific order or just a little bit at a time. Like, I would be daydreaming for the first half of the task, and then I'd start in the middle, like you guys said. And, um... It's hard, and I was on a 504 plan too, so that gave me a little extra time to take tests. And also, I could take tests isolated from people, which was really helpful. And you were able to get help, which was which was fantastic. What kind of help did you get? Um, well, my mom and stepdad argued about me having a learning disability for about three years. Well, my mom was like, "No, she's just a slow learner. She's fine. You know, she she gets it. It just takes time." And my stepdad's like, "She has a serious problem. Like, she can't sit still." She, like, she needs help, and so my mom has a friend, Judy Cormick, who works in Homewood at the Learning Center, and she tested me, and she said that um, I was really fidgety 
so that I had trouble focusing, but when I was focused and engaged, my memory was off the charts compared to most kids, and it still is. So, you know, I got help, and so after I got help, it was very clear that I had ADD because they prescribed me Concerta, which is what most kids get because it has the least side effects. It's like, it doesn't affect your sleep or appetite. And I took that from eighth grade to senior year of high school, and my grades literally went from Fs to Gs. And it, like, I had the same teachers from in seventh grade than I, as I did in eighth grade. And when I started taking in eighth grade, all my teachers were like, "Oh my God, like, like that's crazy! Like, that's insane! You know, you're learning. You're like, I'm so proud of you." And like to hear like someone say like, "I'm so proud of you," was like, I don't even know. It was just it meant a lot to me. It was really like confi- I don't know, boosts my confidence. Um, when I switched to high school, it was obviously hard. Like, I mean, most people switch to high school. It's hard at first to get used to, but I actually, um, I don't know, I did a lot better than I thought I would. I went to the Chicago High School for Agricultural Sciences, which I recommend for anyone with ADD because (laughs) all hands-on learning, everything you do is, like, you do hands-on learning. You're always doing something where you're walking around. <laughs> Chicago High School for Agricultural Sciences. It's good for high school students. So things are better for you, obviously, now. Yeah. Um, when I went to col- I went to SIU for a while, and I I would con- I continued to take my concerto because I don't take it in the summer, really. Like I don't need it. I don't know. But whenever I took it, I got really sad, and I don't know if that is a side effect of concerto after you've been taking it for a while. But I switched to Ritalin which I hated, it was awful. Um, instead of focusing on the things I was supposed to be doing, I would be focusing on things like someone doing this in the class or things like that. <laughs> but um, it, like I left class a few times crying because it's really hard to focus. And like they said, don't put you near a window or <laughs> a heating vent or anything like that. Like it's like something, people don't seem to understand like can be the smallest thing as like someone just going like this but it, it's all I hear it's like the loudest thing I can hear it's really annoying but um I lost a lot of sleep when I was on Ritalin so I switched to Adderall which is I would recommend just for adults I think Adderall is good um my mood is happier it lasts for eight hours I have that extended release one which I like because I get tired easily because I'm all I have such high energy that by the end of the day I'm like trying to go to sleep um I have, I don't know, it's easier for me to do tasks. I don't get as distracted on my way. Sometimes I'll, my mom will tell me, like, go feed the cat. And on the way, I'll, like, go play piano and, like, <laughs> realize my room's a mess. I'll clean it up. I'm like, it's, it's awful. But, um. Now, at least I have one. I, okay. It's going to be a two-part question, and, and then we're going to uh, hope finish our panel and get to our Q&A. Yeah. So with your experiences that you've had, what advice would you give to anybody struggling with ADHD? And and the other part of that is, what are some things that that a student might find to be really helpful to to be a better student with ADHD? Um, Well, first, I'd like to say that when I found out I had ADD, I was really self-conscious about it. Like, nobody likes to hear that you have something wrong with you. And so, first of all, I would like, for anyone with ADD, I'd just like to say it's okay. Like, it's okay to realize that you're not good at things and things are harder for you. Um, most importantly, I'd just say be aware of yourself. What works for you might not work for someone else. So if someone tells you to do something a certain way, it um, doesn't necessarily mean that's the only way to do it. You know, there's always something else. Use Rate My Professor, like seriously. But don't even look at the, like how it says 4.5 or something. Like don't worry about what the numbers say. Like read the comments because only you know how you want to learn. And you, like, you know what's best for you. Um, don't be shy when you ask questions. I know I was, I was in, Kara's cl- or in Kara's class and I was in Nick's class and I'm always like, like I got a question, I got a question, and if we they like don't that answer. Kind of we like that kind of student. <laughs> 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 well, if they, if they don't answer, I'd be like, I'd just say it anyway. Just don't be shy to ask questions because I used to be really shy. Like, I've met students in the class that ask the dumb questions that everyone's like, why did they ask that question? But don't be shy because sometimes someone's wondering the same thing. Um, look up different ways to study. I had to learn how to study, which, like, to some people that's surprising. Like, what do you mean you had to learn how to study? But I always write down everything that I need to remember. Um, and a very important thing is just 
admitting when you're bad at something. It's like a lot of people like take such pride in just being like, no, I'm not bad at that. I'm not bad at that. But like, I'm bad at a lot of things. Like I could tell you a few, and I'm proud to say these things. Um, I start doing one thing and a million other things in between. I sometimes only hear what I want to hear, and it's not by choice. I'm bad at speaking slowly. I'm bad at finding the right words to use. I'm bad at having one conversation at a time. I'm bad at saving money. I'm bad at math. And I have to sit on my hands. <laughs> but, I <laughs> but I work on these things. I really do. I don't know if we need ADHD for some of those things. Yeah. <laughs> no. But no. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, no. but thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. Any Don? One of the one of the things that you that you touched on that I think is really important and and we've seen in the schools is that if there's medication involved, there may be a series of medications that kids go through until they find the one that is most effective. And I think that's that's something that often surprises parents and I think is hard for parents and students to deal with, but it's an important part of the of the treatment process is finding the right one that works. They don't all have the same effect for every student, and we've certainly seen that. The other thing that you highlighted that I think is really interesting is when students um, are placed on medication, um, we, we really prefer that they be placed on medication without the teacher knowing that it's happening. And it rarely fails that the teacher will, within a day or two, come to one of us and say, I don't believe what's going on with whoever. They are a different person. And when we check, we find out the parents started them on medication. Um, the, it's, it's a blind process that actually is, is really effective. The other piece that I think is uh, done by more and more physicians is to do a, a trial with medication and then take them off and then go back on again and look at the effects from that. Um, it's, a, it's a helpful piece, I think, for us to really get a sense as, as to what the, what the benefit is. The last point that I want to touch on that you also mentioned too is a lot of students that have attention difficulties often come to us first as a concern for a learning disability. And in the process of doing the evaluation for a learning disability, we go a different direction because it becomes very clear that while there may be a learning disability as part of the process, that's not the issue that we need to treat primarily. So I think that's important also to add. Thank you. If I could also add, however, that the youngsters that we work with I don't think I've seen any youngster who has a learning disability who does not have an attention difficulty. The, the learning disability, the mm -hmm. reading difficulty that you have, mm -hmm. to me, sounds quite separate from the ADD, and yet it's part of the attention difficulty. That's the issue. Uh, <laughs> you have, it sounds like you have a, a language issue with reading, uh, but you also have an attention separate and they're connected. Yeah. They're Thank you. We're, uh, now, we'd like to open up the uh, Q&A session with some of our questions, but let me say uh, at least thank you for joining us and, sh and sharing that too. Okay. Everybody. Okay. We're going to try our best to get to the questions. Uh, uh, Can I just add one yeah, more yes, thing please, to Elise? Please, Elise, please. Elise, true, and you touch our lives, and it speaks to the power of human potential here. Professor Baker and Professor uh, Williams are going are gonna, to uh, start off with some of our questions. Carol, would you like to start with our first question? What an awesome panel. You guys did such a great job. All right, my first question is an audience member has a seven-year-old that is diagnosed with ADHD and Asperger's. Um, symptoms are very silent, usually fifth grade grade, very emotional, very excitable type, type of. Um, what is the difference between ADHD and Do you remember earlier when we said that? It's a great question. Okay. Attention, the ability to focus attention, sustain attention, switch attention so that we can learn is the foundation of all brain development. It's a very long spectrum. As you move into the more serious problems affecting attention problems, it you move into pervasive developmental problems. And in pervasive developmental disorders, 
they start with the higher end functioning, which is often labeled a high functioning autism spectrum Asperger, where it's a serious condition of attention, but the youngster has other brain areas that are more uh, talented. Um, and then as you move into more serious brain effect, into the more deep pervasive disorders, these are the kids often referred to as the, as the lower level autistic spectrum. Now remember, it doesn't have to just be autism, but there are related pervasive disorders from brain injury, chromosomal disorders, you know, multi brain, uh, multiple disorders that affect the brain that affect the ability to attend. So the answer to that is when there's Asperger, you have an attention problem. You can't have Asperger or high functioning pervasive developmental disorder and not have an attention problem. But can you have ADD and not have Asperger? Yes, it's like if you have severe asthma, you're gonna have some allergy. If you have allergy, you don't have to have asthma. Okay. So it's a viewing of looking at Asperger as a more significant degree of an attention problem and requires a whole different treatment approach than somebody with an attention disorder. Interesting, I will add though, that's why it's being so misdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. ADD is so darn misdiagnosed because it is such a large spectrum and it's not that the attention disorder is, mis is not diagnosed. We know that, that uh, there are attention problems in affecting three or five percent of ch our childhood population. Okay, you know, you're you're talking about a tremendous amount of individuals, and then a high degree of even the adult population. The point is that there are so many, as the panel has pointed out this morning, co-related conditions of attention. And every time somebody has one of those correlated conditions of attention, including Asperger, and then happens to have an attention disorder, they're also diagnosed with ADD. It's like what's happening in autism. Anybody who has a pervasive disorder is all of a sudden autistic today. And that's why that's being so misused. I was just thinking about um, a youngster who uh, was being referred by a psychologist out in Indiana. And the psychologist said, I know that this youngster has Asperger's syndrome. Whether or not this child has an attention deficit, I have not really identified yet. And I said <laughs> to Valerie, oh my God, hey, if you have Asperger's syndrome, you yeah, will does. have an attention <laughs> disorder. There's no question, absolutely no question. However, is it the ADD that is of that checklist variety that that they talk about in driven for distraction, et cetera. No, it's the deep brain attention difficulty that then is part of this comorbid, this shared attentional base that this youngster has. If a child has Asperger's, they have an attention problem. Will they respond to, and this again is my experience, will they respond to Ritalin, eh, Knowing that they have Asperger's syndrome helps to know that they need very specific, different approaches with medication. Adderall may help a small amount. Prozac may help a small amount. But it really takes a whole lot of adjustment, very carefully being monitored to find what works. Add for the person in the audience, because a part of me has to address this, whoever asked the question, the reason you said there's a high degree of seizure, do you remember earlier I said the more severe the attention problem, the higher degree of seizure now, possibility of seizure. Okay, all different kinds of seizures, silent seizures, etc. Please, 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 as I hope you're doing, get that under control, and we s that should be a major part of the treatment plan, because if you take care of electrophysiology, chemistry will transmit more efficiently and a person will adapt with far better potential and adaptability. Thank you. Mitch, I know you have a, a, a couple questions you'd like to ask too from the audience. For time's sake, I'm going to try to group some of the questions together by theme. <laughs> um, a couple of students or, or a couple of questions, concerns are, if you don't have ADHD but you take the medication for it, can you develop ADHD? Interesting. No. <laughs> I mean, no, no. Um, that doesn't mean it's a good idea um, <laughs> because the, the medication will affect you, but no, you will not develop ADHD by virtue of taking medication for it. You but, will. you know, a lot people do think that, um, seriously, so it's, 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 a, it's a good question. Well, because you will develop a very serious attention disorder. 
uh, your attention will be thrown off. You'll fly higher yes. than a kite, and it'll make your mood feel like you're about to burst, and et cetera, et cetera. And if you're an addict and you like that, you'll keep taking it. Yeah. But if you're not, you're going to feel like, oh, my God, what did I just do? Because yeah. these are – we're talking stimulant medications. So I think that's important to understand. Attention, it's an Great excellent question. question. It, it, you know, attention, the function of attention demands uh, efficient chemistry in the brain to let us be alert, but relaxed alertness to be able to learn. So there are chemical inefficiencies, and we said earlier, remember, that most of it is because we have the kids or adults with attention problems have a, a decrease in the degree of these chemicals that allow you to be more alert, even if you're a genius. Um, and even if you're the most wonderful person in the world, it can affect that. Uh, there are also a group of kids who have the electrical conditions, so we have to check that. Rarely is it structure. So the, and the difference there, though, with treatment is, remember, regardless of your underlying problem, whether it's a mild attention deficit due to chemical or electrical activity, remember that you can be born with that or you can have acquired illness to do that. Mm -hmm. You can be born with some oxygen deprivation or have a brain injury or develop other conditions that affect attention. So you can be born with it or have an acquired condition affecting attention. But the treatment, you, the brain learns whether we're one or 101. So yes, early diagnosis is great, but at any age, the brain is going to learn because that's what we, the brain is a remarkable organ and tremendous human potential. So no matter what age, you use the whole brain to treat those underlying chemical, electrical problems, and that's what changes chemistry beyond our genes. That's an extremely important comment. We, can, we now know with this wonderful ability to understand brain chemistry better and electrical, to understand brain better, in human beings, we ha no other animal has this ability. We have the ability to change our brains. We have the ability to use the higher level brains to control the attention. Not just the medicines, which obviously are extremely efficient when they are properly diagnosed and treated, but we have beautiful abilities to use all these other conditions that, and treatments that we've been talking about and many more today than, than we discussed today that help the brain change beyond genes, mm -hmm. beyond injury, and beyond illness. So whether you have a genetic predisposition, whether you have an injury, whether you have some illness affecting attention, there's tremendous help for, for you to be able to change and develop your potential. And that's proven over and over and over. And only human beings have that tremendous ability. There, there is also a genetic connection in the sense that um, when, we see, when we see kids in schools, many times when we're talking with them, with their parents, their parents will identify very similar symptoms. I, I, I don't know what the prevalence is genetically, but direct, when there's a direct family connection, um, the prevalence is pretty high. Um, prenatal exposures. Yes, it's much higher. Um, prenatal exposure can also exacerbate or develop into, AD, into attention issues. Um, alcoholism or alcohol um, ingestion, um, smoking are two risk factors that we know of for ADHD. In the years I've been with Dr. Nowinski, I've heard her often say that the attention issues that we're looking at in many cases are multi-generational, mm -hmm. that uh, the skills the personality that allowed us to have our ancestors leave their home of origin as Europe, Africa, Asia, come here to the United States, did it take people who were somewhat more impulsive and, <laughs> you know, more risk-taking people to, to be here in the first place? Those, those are very positive behaviors which perhaps in an environment like moving their way across the country and chopping down trees and making their way across our wonderful country uh, serve them well. But sitting in classrooms Not where so they have to <laughs> keep their well. buns in place all day and listen, which an auditory is the least strong of, of the ways to learn in classrooms, I mean, uh, we are much more visual people in the United States. So, so is it really an attention deficit? Is it a problem for, for me?
many people it truly is, it, it, it affects them lifelong. For many, it's, it's a, a situational learning problem within traditional learning settings. Um, it, recall, please, that we each are filled with talents. And look at those things that you do well, as well as those that are distinctive. And, and work around those things that are distinctive with good friends and good support system. Um, what causes it? Um, it's multi-generational, it's accidents, it's, it's, pre, pre, it's birth related, it's, it's viral related, it's who knows. There are so many issues that are involved. The point is to make the most of who you are with what you have and to find those talents that are within us. We don't think about the strengths a lot. We look at some of the deficits that we have. I, I think we have time for some more questions. Okay, uh, once a problem is recognized, and maybe you can answer this from both a, as a, as maybe from a child as well as an adult, but once the problem is first uh, recognized, who would you suggest should be the first professional that you should seek out? Psychologist, uh, physician, um, and also, if I can add to that, just to kind of lump some questions together, what do you recommend if someone does not have health insurance? Oh, wow. <laughs> so, no, that, no, that's a from two ways, that's a, no, that's you know, with insurance, that. without insurance. As someone who sits in several different seats here, um, educationally, um, the schools are wonderful for um, giving tests to see how well a youngster may do in a school setting, a traditional school setting. Um, they, however, are not aware of the kind of testing and information that can be gathered from someone like Dr. Nowinski, who looks at the brain and looks at the whole child and not just how they do in school. So I think it depends on what your issues are. Personally, professionally, I would typically recommend that you find out the wholeness of what's involved. Because it could be that this child doesn't just have social problems, they're having seizures. It could be that it looks like they're having an attention problem, but they're really having seizures or, and or they're having mood issues that are compounding it. So to get to the bottom of the whole issue, I think is of the essence. Um, because to deal with only one piece is is to miss out on the wholeness of what could be going on. Yeah, I, I think I think the issue is that there's not a single individual that you would want to work through. I think uh, I think the best approaches are clearly a team approach, and whether that team is entirely school based or it's school based and community based, it needs to be a team process because there. If, different people will bring different kinds of expertise to the process. And a single individual is probably not the best route to go. Um, our, our best responses have been when we've had a number of players involved in the diagnostic process and in the development of the treatment plan. So, so if it is diagnosed in the school, per se, um, or it's recognized, um, does the school typically, at that point, suggest physician or psychologist? or a combination of the two if the family's seeking something beyond what the school's diagnosis is? The schools are in an interesting position um, because we, we need to, we legally have to focus on the educational components. And we cannot require parents to go beyond the school if they choose not to do that. Uh, we also cannot make school plans contingent on medication or something to that, to that effect. Um, so we're, we're restricted in, in some ways in terms of where we can place our focus. Um, what we often do is encourage parents to share this information with their first, their, their physician. Many times they don't have any medical connections beyond their family physician. Uh, if parents ask us what steps they can take outside of school, it's easier for us to say, okay, get in touch with these people. Um, we also have an obligation to provide them with more than one individual or one, more than one um, service 
if you will, in terms of making that referral process. I think the insurance question was a good one. Too, yes, it's very good one. because um, that probably relates to a lot of people. It's less of an issue, obviously, if, if we're focusing on the educational piece because the insurance usually doesn't come into play. It's when you get out into looking at medic medication interventions or treatment outside of school that the insurance comes into play. Yeah, and I'll just say, say yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I wanted to say something about the insurance because more often than not, the person without insurance is not getting any interventions until there's a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, especially in Illinois, the interventions that are available to them are very limited. Um, usually the community mental health centers in the area are taking, um, are absorbing most of um, those people and those resources are very limited. Um, so that person without insurance might be getting a sliding scale um, therapist. They might not be able to afford even the sliding scale, but also medications are very expensive. Um, so very often the person with ADHD without insurance is sliding through the cracks, um, slipping through the cracks and not getting the treatment that they need. Um, and then we're seeing them show up in the legal system. Um, so that's, it's actually a really good question. But usually, and Nick, I know you've worked in community mental health, that's right. where we're seeing these people in crisis. That's true, in crisis, and sometimes it takes a long time for those individuals to get treated because yeah. uh, there's so many individuals list. without insurance to where you have to wait at least mm -hmm. several weeks, probably a month to go see somebody. Yeah. And significant like wraparound type services are so limited. Um, going in for neuropsych testing is, that's not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. Going in to see a therapist, you know, maybe twice a month, a, a social worker at the community mental health center, much more realistic where they're just going to get, you know, basic skills. But though the, the multi-dimensional mm -hmm. part of it that they need, they're not getting. Um, so it's important to say who's out. Well, I would add just a couple things. Um, more before the insurance part, where do people go? Parents are very sophisticated these days and becoming more and more sophisticated because of the degree of knowledge that has been developed. So if I were to think of the, and again, having seen thousands of kids, you know, parent to parent, parent and kids themselves, uh, from birth to 21 we see kids, they are the ones the first referrals. They come themselves, they talk ab amongst each other. Mm. And those are the people who come first, okay? Um, the pediatrician, then they go to their pediatricians and then their schools has been our experience. Okay, so the pediatricians are the next number one referring, or family care doc, and the schools refer. They refer the more serious cases, <laughs> but, then, but um, a lot of parents will first then go to the school district to get an eval, but then they'll say, well, but again, that's a beautiful dimension and needs to be done, but because of the, all the advanced knowledge, they also know there's a physical physiology end of it, so they have to go to the medical piece, and then the therapeutic behavioral pieces. So it really does come together. and. In the United States, the majority of people do have health care, but there's an alarming amount of kids who don't, but most people are being treated and are seeking, and all the neuroscience tests and the evaluations are covered by that. You know, in the schools, you can get those obviously free through the public funding. The kids, uh, and with hopefully more health care to all people and all kids, et cetera, insurance, more and more kids are being allowed access. But the point is well taken that when somebody doesn't have access to insurance, it is landing up in the community mental health, or the, it, the, it is on the shoulders of the school to try to do a lot of services, and the schools, I think that's why are referring more and more, because they're saying, people, yes, we have, we have these great educational avails, but you need to try to get s some more, you know, services. But it is true, these, uh, the community uh, health centers, you know, are, and feeling a tremendous amount of pressure, and now uh, hopefully it's changing so they're going to start to get more funding. If you're familiar with the more recent public policy, it's moving that way, thank God. Um, early intervention is interesting because it used to be that if a child could have free services, and, and they still do early interventions, birth to three in the United States, and you can get free services in the treatment of your children. Um, but it required years ago, when I was first, you know, or back in 35 more years ago, a child, all they had to do was have a 70, they had to have a 70% delay and they would get services. Then it went down to a 50% delay. Now it's a 30% delay only. So look at the kids are being missed because they're not, they have serious problems, but they're not showing up. Um, they say, well, you know, you know, it's a, 
it's just, it's very sad, you know. Uh, there are a lot of kids who don't have a 30% delay, but they have some serious problems, okay, and then they're being missed. Um, it's just, it's sad, you know, but nevertheless, those early intervention services do apply in the United States. Illinois is actually one of the better ones with that. And health, health uh, insurance is trying to move to all people and all kids, and hopefully we'll have more help. But in the meantime, it is a very serious issue. Dr. Winsky, thank you. Find professionals who will just see you whether you have insurance or not. <laughs> <laughs> if I could also add, um, be, be very aware of the kind of professional that you do go to. Uh, often I see in younger families going to the pediatrician who's really good at diagnosing snot noses and, and, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and coughs um, may really not have any idea of what is developmentally appropriate for a child and may just say, oh, watch them, they'll outgrow that. You really want to be certain that uh, you help parents or you yourself stick with that gut feeling that, that something's not quite right. Like, thank you again for having shared your experience with me. Um, it's, and, and even if you go to a neuropsychologist, you want to make sure that there are holistic neuropsychologists who gets that the medical profession involved as well, who takes a look at the eyes, the ears, the, the wholeness of who the child is and who the person is. Because sometimes it's a physical issue that really can be dealt with much more simply. So, you know, I trust that gut that you have as to whether or not this is really, does this make sense? Or is this, oh yeah, I, I want to hear what this pediatrician has to say because I don't want to have to believe that my child has any other issues. So just, just you know, listen with as many ears as you want. I think we have time for one more question and then we're going to end our program. I know many people have class at 12 o'clock as well. Kara, uh, do we have one more question? A lot of pieces there. Um, I think with the with the younger students, the the jealousy is not so much an issue, um, and even the the fact that they're being maybe singled out is not so much of an issue, at least in our experience. I think as you get older, um, you you touched on that. I think there's there's a lot more sensitivity to being different as you get into the upper elementary grades and certainly in middle school and high school. So I think kids are reluctant sometimes to, I know for a fact actually, having, having um, worked with older kids, that many of them are reluctant to have the accommodations um, in school settings. So some of the accommodations tend to be more subtle and less obvious. Um, seating arrangements usually are not real obvious to, to students. Um, one of the things that we, and this is where the sort of multidimensional approach comes in, um, Doing the accommodations without helping them understand why they're being done is not productive. So I think part of what needs to be part of the process is for them to kind of understand a little bit about what's going on with them and why those accommodations are necessary and how they're going to help them. Um, the teachers actually sometimes are reluctant to do something special for kids that need those accommodations. It's like, why do I have to do this for Johnny? I don't do it for anybody else, and my response uh, I'm usually pretty tactful about it, but it's so basically Johnny's different, so we need to be different with Johnny. Um, treating Johnny the same way as everybody else in the classroom is not going to help him out. So we have to come up with a plan that's going to support him and allow him to function in that classroom. Um, many of the accommodations that we can do for students that have attention deficit difficulties will help other kids as well. So they can be class-wide and benefit the targeted students, but also be of benefit to the other students in the classroom. Ellie, did you want to share some insights? In the yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so I got diagnosed with ADD in eighth grade, but it was clear I had a problem for a long time. And I 
before I was even on the 504 plan, my teachers did allow me to have extra time. I, I don't know if they were allowed to do that or not, but mm -hmm. they just realized they were. They were okay. <laughs> well, it was, I don't know, it's just what they did for me. And even in grammar school, I was taken out of my classes at certain, like, specific times a day. And I remember, like, I would purposely go to the bathroom at a specific time just so that I would run into the person that was going to take me out of my class because it was embarrassing to be taken out of class in front of everyone. And, like, I would I would always be observed when I was doing my homework. There would always be someone, like, in the corner, like, staring at me, like, writing notes. I'm like, what are you, like, why are you, why are you looking at me? <laughs> Stop looking at me. And people notice those things. Like, why do you always have someone following you around? Like, why do you get taken out of class? Or why, why do you get extra time and I don't? And I never understood the answer to those questions because I didn't really understand that there was something wrong with me. I just kind of thought that's how things had to be. And um, I actually had one of my teachers when I was going to elementary school, I, I like very quietly was like, I, I don't think I'm gonna finish in time, you know, like so no one can hear. And she goes, you know, you can't always get extra time, okay? You have to finish. And everyone like was like kind of laughing and it's embarrassing, you know, and I, I think that some people do get jealous. Like, why does she get more time and I don't? But I don't know. It's I, I know that I wouldn't want everyone to know that I had ADD, but if I could go back and just like give it, like just let teachers know that, yeah, I don't know, be more assertive or just let people know not everyone learns the same. And if you feel like you need extra time on a test too, maybe we can work something out because I, I think that a lot of kids do need extra time. I don't know, I think. Yeah, one of, one of the things that I think is helpful, particularly in middle school and high school, is how you schedule students' classes. Mm -hmm. Because being pulled out of class, yes, if you're already in your seventh or eighth grade classroom or your high school classroom and somebody comes to get you, yes, that's hugely embarrassing. embarrassing. So one of the things that, that we would try to do, um, the district I work for went through middle school. And one of the things that we frequently tried to do was to schedule support times in such a way that it would not be obvious that a student was getting extra help. Um, that helps tremendously. Um, high schools have that capability as well to play with the schedule so that students um, are not in situations where they have to, to uh, give explanations they might find difficult to give. I think that um, ADD is something that you have all of your life. Mm -hmm. And um, the, m the sooner we can help youngsters understand what their attention difficulties are and help the other students understand what the attention difficulties are and to celebrate the positives that we have as a community together mm -hmm. to accept that this is what Johnny needs or Elise needs. Uh, and if you needed it, we give it to you too. Um, I think that rather than having children feel that they are in competition with each other, but they're a community working together, and um, it, it's a gift that we can give to students to help them when they're young to accept themselves as they are, and we have to help the teachers to accept that yep. children, each of us are individuals too, and that we learn differently. Because attitude is so much of it. If we can help all of the youngsters, with or without, well, we all have some kind of disability, <laughs> don't we? With or without disabilities, but if we can help all of us to be more accepting of one another, then I think this all becomes less of a Sure, D Dr. Nowinski, can you give us a final thought? If I were uh, to leave you with one culminating idea, I would say this, and it goes with what everyone just said. Um, we all have differences in our human potential. The ability to attend, we all have it at times. It, it, you know, sometimes <laughs> we can attend well and sometimes we just can't, you know, with or without space, and so on, et cetera. However, what I've often said to families, to the kids, to, to my students, if the ability to attend is affecting your ability to adapt at home, the home environment, or if it's and or affecting the ability to adapt at school or beyond, neighborhood, friendships, whatever, if it's affecting the ability to adapt with health and well-being, then it's a problem. Mm -hmm. If we have an attention problem and it's not affecting our health, then it's humanness. And that should be the guiding factor of getting help for attention. 100%.
I can't thank the panel members enough. Let's give another hand for sharing all their expertise with us today. And thank you for joining us. And hopefully you're walking out of here with some uh, knowledge and, and, and better understanding of uh, the topics that we were talking about today. Enjoy your class. Enjoy the weather. Enjoy the last part of the semester. And thank you again.